Well, good, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Innovations in Healthcare Learning in Action uh, Network uh, presentation. We have a great panel uh, this morning. I just want to take a, a, a few minutes to go through our agenda and uh, some, some house rules before introducing them and getting right into the, into the topic. So um, just take five minutes to go over some general guidelines. Uh, we'll have the, the panel on combating uh, misinformation during the, the COVID pandemic. Uh, that should take about 45 minutes. Uh, we're gonna have plenty of time uh, for, for questions and answers uh, at the end. I'll also feel free to actually join in uh, at, uh, at, at any time. We really want this to be not only an active discussion amongst the, the panel members, we have with us, uh, but also would love to uh, hear your your uh, experiences uh, out on the front lines, uh, uh, treating patients, and and any sort of lessons learned that you have as well. Um, just general guidelines: please keep your mic muted uh, and the video off when you're not uh, participating. But feel free to obviously to turn those on. Um, you can raise your hand to speak. Uh, there's an icon at the bottom of the person participants panel. Um, or you can, you can chat your question anytime. Uh, this is being recorded uh, and we will, we will post uh, the link to that recording in the call topics in groups.io and also available through our blog and our website. Uh, please keep the conversation going. We have a, we'll have a discussion thread uh, on this topic. Uh, continue to question your questions for each other in the panel. So with that, Let's jump right in uh, to the panel. I'll, I'll have uh, our panelists introduce themselves uh, or in the order here on the on the slide, and I'll start off with you, uh, uh, with with you, Dr. Fox. Let's. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, currently a Rubenstein Fellow at Duke University, as well as um, an advisor and consultant to twenty or thirty other things. Um, with respect to misinformation. Uh, my focus and background has actually been more on disinformation and malinformation. And specifically with that, you know, the, the difference there in, in Eric's words versus someone else's is with, with disinformation and malinformation, not only does the intent of harm or level of malfeasance go up and solidify, um, often it's also very highly organized. So, you know, said differently, um, I've got an aunt that I love dearly who's been posting on Facebook for 20 years that chlorine in water is really bad for people. And that's not the type of thing that I focus on. Um, I really focus more on uh, disinformation and malinformation, including how to use cybersecurity, offensive cybersecurity techniques against really active uh, and potentially destructive campaigns, such as those done by nation state actors. Uh, so that's more my background. Excellent. Well, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Anita. Hi everyone, I'm Anita Pasha. I'm the country director of IRD Pakistan uh, and also the director of the mental health program specifically. Um, in the COVID context, IRD in Pakistan has rolled out a community-based uh, COVID model, which essentially aims to provide free oxygen therapy at the primary care level, uh, because currently uh, COVID treatment in Pakistan is just happening at the tertiary care level. So the idea is to provide free oxygen therapy and components of that include mental health counseling as well as contact tracing, um, as well as a community awareness uh, perspective. Welcome Anita, thank you so much uh, for joining us this morning or this afternoon, I guess as the case may be. So uh, Ali, can you uh, introduce yourself and tell me a little bit about uh, SWAP? Sure. Uh, thanks for inviting me. My name is Ali Elefeld. I'm from the Netherlands, but permanent resident in Kenya. I left the Netherlands in 1984. I'm a pediatric nurse, but specialized in tropical medicine and public health. And I'm founder of SWAP Safe Water and AIDS Project. We were one of the finalists in 2016. Um, yeah, our program is operating in Western Kenya, uh, public health programs, research and emergency response. Uh, our mission is to provide innovative solutions uh, to improve health and economic status of communities, 
And our focus has been a lot on water and sanitation, social marketing, social behavioral change communication, menstrual hygiene management, maternal health, clean energy and nutrition, early childhood development, and so much more. We also have a water lab supporting the activities. Yeah, that's in short who I am. Well, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. And our last panelist is Sandeep uh, Kapila. Have you, uh, were you able to join us, Sandeep? Okay, it looks like we're, we're, we're trying to, to get uh, him logged on and we'll, we'll have him introduce himself uh, in a second, but let's go ahead and, and uh, get started uh, with our panel. So sort of first off, um, just get sort of the, understand sort of the, the, the extent of the problem as, as, as you see it impacting yourselves or, or you know, as, as it's understood across the Across the world, in fact, the World Health Organization has called the spread of misinformation around the coronavirus an infodemic. In your experience, can you describe the extent of the challenge facing healthcare providers specifically? Uh, which constituencies are affected? Patients, your own providers, policymakers, and and uh, you know, to the extent that for I guess for our innovators, you know, how is it affecting your operations? And uh, Eric, let's let's start with you on, on that. Uh, sure. So, you know, a couple of things. I think there's probably three things. I spent uh, some of June in out west in the tribal nations of uh, the USA, uh, Native Americans helping out. And, you know, frankly, on the ground, I'm not seeing as much uh, conflict and contradictory information as I'm often seeing, you know, on the internet or virtually, right? Um, so I think there's a couple of things. I think, well, in the US, I think we've made a spectacular mess of things. Um, and I, I, what, what's happened in the U.S., you know, from the standpoint of basic misinformation, is that science has kind of fallen victim to the ongoing ideology wars that play out in every part of our lives in the U.S. right now, certainly in the upcoming presidential election. And so the, you know, the things that you're seeing, one, is that the well-reasoned well uh, people in the center, are, a lot of them are actually unsure where to go for information. And I think one of the things that medicine in the US um, needs to think differently about is I often talk about misinformation not as an information problem. In the US, I think medicine has a trust problem that has a media dimension. And that's somewhat different, right? Because the, the root cause that needs to be treated is trust. The other thing is that they, there is simply no single source of truth in the US. I've seen other countries that have been much more um, kind of consolidated and focused in what their messaging is. You know, there's, there is a national health service and their message is this. The US doesn't have a national health service. We have municipal, state, county, and federal agencies all not saying the same thing. So I think there's that. So there's, there's that, that, that confusion part of it. But then the other part of it is, um, and this is a little closer to my own work, is that you know, with the push for a vaccine, you know, I think there's two real challenges that we're trying to get out in front of with vaccines. First and foremost is the anti-vax message is already growing. And one recent poll already said that half, it's found that half the Americans might choose not to get a vaccine when it's available. And so obviously there's a lot of work to be done there. And that's, that's traditional anti-anti-vax stuff. But the other thing is, um, from the more kind of security side of what I do, is that I also expect extensive counterfeiting with respect to vaccines and these cures that will be worldwide problems going forward. Um, so, so it's not just information, it's also securing the supply chain, labeling, track and trace, and some of these other things that are going on. So that's kind of the two classes of issues that, that we're facing here. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I guess what Anita, can, what, how, is the, how extensive is the problem from, from your perspective? Um, sure, uh, thanks, Jed. So, you know, in Pakistan, um, a lot of the misinformation uh, obviously, I think globally stems from a lack of information um, and a lack of accurate information. Again, a large part of our population are unable to read or write. They don't have access to the internet or media. And so there's just a lack of appropriate messaging for them. And, and what that has done is driven a fear. Uh, there's a fundamental fear in people at the community level and the fear of the unknown from where conspiracy theories have now come out uh, and came out from the beginning. Um, and what that translates to on a practical level is that patients um, and people in general have just been 
uh, you know, really afraid to seek care, whether that is for their COVID symptoms or even otherwise. The idea is just to stay as far away from healthcare providers and hospitals as possible, because if you are, if you go there, you may get tested. If you're tested, you may get sent off to an isolation unit. You won't be able to meet your family and your friends. And, uh, and if you die there, then, you know, they won't even release your body. And so uh, just a fundamental fear has spread in communities to stay away from there. For us, what that has meant, as, as our teams are doing a lot of the mental health support and the contact tracing, is that there's just, uh, you know, people don't want to admit to uh, having any symptoms or they don't share information about their contacts um, to be tested or just, you know, trying to convince them to isolate themselves and quarantine themselves. Um, uh, so, so that has been really problematic. Overall, it has resulted, the fear has resulted in a lack of trust to healthcare providers. Because as I said, the idea is that, you know, the conspiracy theory is that doctors are doing research on COVID. And uh, if you go there, they will just take you, use you um, for, for, you know, for research. And then there is no such thing as COVID. And then they'll just release you and nothing happens. And this also leads uh, back to not understanding the asymptomatic nature of the disease. So if I'm not, if I don't have any symptoms, it possibly means that, I, it definitely means I'm not sick, but it definitely means the healthcare provider is taking me for a ride. Um, there was a case in June when things were really extreme where a mob of people attacked a tertiary care hospital and attacked doctors and nurses with sticks and just you know, broke everything and were yelling that you know, there is no COVID, Corona doesn't exist. Um, so there's also that which has driven people to an, to an extreme sense, especially because of the frustration around lockdown. Um, oh, and so there's that. In addition, there's groups of people who have a very fatalistic approach to it, to say that, you know, it may be there, it may not be there. If, it, if we're going to get it, we're going to get it. There's nothing anybody can do about it. So all of the measures, the precautionary measures that we are trying to take actually are pointless. Um, because it's going to happen if it's going to happen. On the flip side, with the GPs, uh, the general practitioners that we are working with at the community level, what we have found is we have approached them for our COVID model to provide free oxygen, is a hesitancy on the part of the healthcare providers to opt in because they feel like if they are labeled as being a COVID unit or if they're labeled as being a place where COVID patients come, uh, this is gonna affect their business and other patients are going to stop coming. So they are, they are happy to remain in, in the bubble that they remain in. They may see patients who have COVID symptoms, but they wouldn't report it. Um, and they would just, you know, treat it like the ordinary flu and send people home. So we've been seeing a, a mix of reactions uh, across the entire spectrum. Wow. Thank you, Thank you uh, for sharing that. Um, Certainly, yeah, very, very different reactions depending on, on part of the globe and, and um, different different problems facing different providers. Uh, uh, Ali, can you can you share uh, your experience in Kenya? Sure. Um, yeah, here there's really not a united voice and a lot of misinformation and fear and stigma, and to the extent that people shy away from healthcare facilities. First of all, they are afraid that maybe they will get tested and are put on forced isolation. And secondly, they are afraid to catch the virus in the healthcare facilities. So Kenya had made a lot of positive gains when it comes to issues like maternal health care, immunization, access to family planning and antiretroviral therapy. But now people are shying away. So we are very concerned about all the other services, which there's no focus on it because the Minister of Health is also really working on COVID and almost ignoring some of the other services which people really need. Uh, so we see a lot of teenage pregnancies now and people can't access their cancer screenings and such things. And on the other hand, uh, you find that health workers in uh, remote public healthcare facilities, uh, they don't have uh, updated information because also they are lacking access to internet and everything and uh, very few people reach there with uh, health messaging. So they're ill prepared. Uh, so for us, we have uh, really worked on COVID-19 response by also including social behavioral change communication and health messaging and COVID-19 prevention uh, guided by the Minister of Health so that uh, the messages reach those who need it the most. Thank you, Ali. Sandeep, I understand you're, you're able to join us? Yes, yes. Welcome, Sorry welcome. for the delay, yes. 
please, please tell us a little bit about uh, your yourself and Swath, and then and then uh, a, a sort of what yeah. your experience is on the ground with with sort of the extent the problem that you see from your perspective. Sure. So uh, I am a from background wise, uh, uh, education wise, a computer science graduate from IIT Bombay, and then. Uh, did a little bit, almost six and a half years at McKinsey and Company as a management consultant. That's how I picked up my uh, awareness of uh, of health. And for the last now 12 years, uh, I've been, I founded SWAST with the goal of health and joy for all. Uh, so our mission is health and joy for all. The way we try and achieve that is by building a sustainable and accountable health ecosystem with joy. And we are doing that as a pilot, as a representation in Mumbai, in the city of Mumbai, uh, in India. Uh, Mumbai alone houses close to 30 million people. So it's, uh, it's a very large population. And to say how we can build a, an accountable system uh, for the city of Mumbai has been what we have been working at. Uh, the way we do it is primarily focus on uh, primary care and preventive well-being. Uh, we provide uh, primary and preventive health services through a network of uh, clinics or medical centers, as we call them, which are manned by a doctor uh, and provide medicines, pathology lab tests, doctor consultations, and also wellness services through yoga and Ayurveda in particular. So that's sort of, uh, we currently run a network of 20 such uh, centers in Mumbai, serving close to two and a half million population in the catchment. Uh, I think uh, coming to uh, in terms of what we saw on the ground and what happened, particularly related to uh, information sharing on COVID, uh, I think there were two kinds of information that we saw. One was around COVID itself, the disease, uh, how to prevent it, what can be done, what are the precautions to be taken. Uh, and the second was around what to do uh, if uh, uh, if somebody is diagnosed or has symptoms, what do they do next, right? Uh, and these are very specific things related with COVID. Besides this, there was a whole need of information which was around other essential services. So particularly when the lockdown was imposed, uh, a lot of people were uh, stranded uh, in India, uh, particularly a lot of migrant workers. Uh, they were left jobless without incomes in a foreign city, uh, where they did not have any other source, possibly no savings, um, in terms of what they could do, what they should be doing next, how do they move? So there is, uh, how do they get access to the essentials like even food, etc. So basically, uh, there were, to put it uh, in the other way, the three kinds. Two of them were related to COVID, which is how do I prevent? What is COVID, etc. The second was how, what do I do if I have been, if I see symptoms of COVID? What's the next step? And the third was. Uh, actually around what about the other essential services. Uh, what we saw was very quickly, I think initially uh, for a week or so, there was a lot of information which was flowing around what is COVID, what is not. And, and I'm talking of the masses, not people necessarily who have uh, who use extensively the, the internet, but in our communities, the urban poor, uh, that was very quickly, I think, arrested with the media also playing a very proactive role uh, sharing sort of more the official and the uh, filtered out uh, messaging. So the government came up with posters, uh, with with messaging, uh, video messages very quickly. Uh, and I think that started circulating both in the media as also on the ground. However, that was limited only to the first part largely, which is around what, uh, how to prevent COVID, what to do, what is COVID a little bit, what's this virus about, etc. So it was those details. I think what went missing and there was a lot of confusion around was what to do if I have symptoms, uh, be it in terms of, I think there was information around calling a helpline uh, that wasn't very, uh, I think initially uh, responded to, even as we ran our clinics during this time, uh, we weren't clear oftentimes how to and where to refer people, if you we were seeing people with symptoms. So at times there was a long wait period between that as well. And, and people, uh, I think like Anita also pointed out and some others, they had this, I think, fear because it wasn't clear what will happen. 
they had this fear of going to the hospital of even trying to test themselves uh, for covid so they would delay uh, that test as much as possible i remember initially we had to like even call the police and still uh, that didn't happen where a patient uh, had to be tested for covid in the initial days because there was a lot of stigma and fear that if i am detected with covid what will happen to me right so how where will i go i will be isolated i won't be able to meet my family etc and i think there was a lot of fear uh, which got built around that uh, i think even subsequently we have seen that the government uh, has changed so in india covid management has been driven by the government largely so <coughs> the government has kept has evolved their guidelines both in terms of medically but also facility guidelines on where to go what will happen uh, to people who are detected uh, how will they separate out people with symptoms without symptoms the quarantine facility etc and i think that information was not easily available uh, my sense was that was a very local information in the sense it varied from city to city and that's why it didn't come also on the media um, on on uh, even on the social media it didn't become very accessible so it, that was one piece of information which was very hard to get uh, i think the on the third piece as well which was around essential services and other services uh, there again uh, there were a lot of promises made nationally but for that promise to translate into the ground saying okay i should i should expect food rational or food essentials uh, this much but whether that will come in one week 10 days one month i think that was not at all clear and that created a lot of anxiety and panic in people uh, after a certain point of time so uh, same uh, i think happened with the migration or the movement of people uh, i think initially that piece of that the other sort of things uh, that information was not very clear which i think created a sense of panic fear and sometimes also resulted in people taking uh, uh, taking steps which may have facilitated the spread of the virus so like there was an instance where a mob came of 1000 people to one spot to ask for this information uh, almost like an agitation at the peak of the lockdown so those are then steps that people had to take to get access to such information in here so uh, i think the the covid information was clear uh, initially but the other two pieces were we found there was a little bit challenge uh, that happened great thank thank you thank you for for sharing so yeah i mean I, i'm seems to be a a theme of of fear uh leading to to issues of, of trust in the erosion of trust in the medical uh system um that we see uh, occurring across all these accounts um and some of the sort of the i guess I want to talk specifically about messages that that keep keep coming up or at least miss around disinformation or even or sort of um, malinformation that's out there that's persistent and sort of like get everybody's perspective we certainly have heard this sort of fear of being taken away uh from your family as 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 one thing there's there's the 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 idea that uh that this covid isn't real and that it's some sort of uh, conspiracy can can uh, can anybody on the panel sort of like talk about sort of other other persistent myths that are that are interfering with your ability to deliver deliver healthcare not necessarily to covid patients but to 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 all of your patients could i say something please yeah so um in kenya over 90% of the covid cases are asymptomatic and uh, only a 2% fatality rate and we have so many other more pressing problems so people kind of don't believe it when they don't see they say i have never seen somebody sick and uh, so they almost ignore all the guidelines because they feel it's kind of non existing uh, so that is really hurting us because um, people are not complying with the preventive mes- uh, measures i think the uh, this is eric um i think the other thing about some of the messages you said is that it's first and foremost real important to make sure that they're not true um you know, having worked in uh west africa during the 24 1415 ebola outbreak you know we had a very similar situation if if you know group of workers often foreign folks in in space suits comes to your village 
uh, because you're sick. And if they take you away, your family never sees you again. And unfortunately, a lot of times that was true. And so I think that um, public health messaging has to be a little more comprehensive. If you test positive, this is what happens. If you are hospitalized, this is where your family can go to find out information. I think, um, I think uh, a lot of what we see worldwide is kind of bad ideas and imagination filling a vacuum where really solid, clear public health policy should have first filled that void when possible. It's not always possible. If I can also add to this, Jed, uh, to, to answer your question about persistent myths. Um, so one of uh, one or two uh, that are very prevalent here in Pakistan is, uh, you know, around uh, the government had implemented policies around limiting the number of people who could uh, attend funerals. But over here, that was taken so, so, um, so badly. It was such a backlash because people believe that the fewer people you have coming to your funeral, the fewer, ch the lesser your chances of actually going to heaven, because you don't have enough people praying for you at that time. And so, you know, the, the idea was just so alien to the fact that uh, actually you just need to have your, you know, three to five or maximum 10 family members. Uh, the, the, there were actually numbers that people would say, you have to have a minimum of 40 people to even have a chance. So obviously, um, uh, pre precautionary measures around funerals were completely ignored um, uh, during this period. Uh, and again, coming back to hiding if somebody had passed away from COVID or hiding the information about somebody um, became really prevalent. The other one, of course, was that uh, there's, uh, because of this, there's a lot of the racial and ethnic profiling of Chinese people. Because again, uh, this is the quote unquote Chinese virus. And so we saw a lot of that as well. And I think a lot of um, the, the stereotyping of uh, people, and then they, the, you know, people, chi people from China who live in Pakistan have had to face this as well. Completely being avoided, it's almost as if they are carrying the virus around with them. Uh, and the and the third really big one has been just the idea that you know Muslims cannot get corona uh, because we eat halal food, um, you know, kosher food. And that's why it's just not even possible for us to get it. And because, you know, Muslims pray five times a day. And so because of that, we don't even need to follow the, the protocols or do any of this because we're just, we're immune naturally. And so these are some of the, 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 the thinking around when things were happening and the resistance to the lockdown and this is just the resistance to following protocols. So um, the messaging obviously has to be culturally appropriate. All very, very challenging uh, issues to, to to face with, and and you know, I guess let's talk. Let's talk about, um, I guess, shift gears a little bit from the problem, maybe to talking about potential solutions and what are ways that you have found that are effective in combating uh, misinformation and and malinformation and. Um, um, for what sort of what messaging strategies have you found to be particularly effective and for which specific audiences around timing and channels and, and, and uh, that sort of things? Or are there any, any uh, recommendations that you could provide to the other folks in the audience? And I would welcome anybody in the audience also to, to uh, chime in as well if they've uh, found things to be useful in their context as well. What we have seen uh, has been very useful to reach the most vulnerable and hard to reach uh, population is by engaging community health volunteers and training them on social behavioral change communication and training them on the, the latest COVID-19 regulations who then go to the households. They will each be assigned around 100 households uh, with this messaging. And I think that has also been the experience Eric was talking about West Africa in Ebola. And it's, a lot went wrong because of uh, mixed messages and misinformation. So it could get out of control. So by reaching those, you can reach a lot of people at household level uh, to you know, go into preventive messages because the messages are also like wearing a mask and washing your hands and having soap in the homes and so many other simple basic messages which can uh, prevent the spread. What, what sort of format is that? Is that just done orally or, or is there any kind of... Sort of uh, no, we've actually uh, continued going to 
uh, first of all, healthcare facilities, uh, which we had a whole program of uh, water and sanitation and waste management at healthcare facility, whereby we were uh, offering also simple supplies, which now became very useful during the COVID-19 response, such as hand washing stations and waste management. And then we were training the health workers and we were also training the community health volunteers, some who were attached to the healthcare facilities, but who were also assigned households uh, with hygiene promotion and uh, health messages and com social behavioral change communication. Anita? Yeah, so I think that, um, uh, so one of the big things I think at a broader level is that um, uh, the feeling is that a lot of the messaging that has come out around COVID has been very Western centric. And some of it has just been completely impractical for um, our, the people in communities to, to implement. So for example, you know, we've talked a lot about self-quarantine and self-isolation, but we have had actually people who we have called on our helpline or who have called us actually say we are 10 to 12 people in a two room house. What are you expecting? Where am I going? Where am I mean, it's just an impossible thing to ask them to self-isolate if they test positive. And then, of course, as I had said, there's all the, the fear, the, all the fear and anxiety around the isolation unit and going to a hospital. So at the household level, it has been impractical for, uh, for people to hear about uh, self-isolation or washing hands frequently when they don't have water um, or just uh, focusing more, you know, the whole conversation was so much about COVID that people even now don't want to talk about it. They want to talk about their livelihoods. They want to talk about schools. They want to talk about where, uh, the, where they're getting employment from or on daily basis. So it's almost as if we the last thing they want to talk about. Um, and so what we found uh, has been helpful is um, just putting the conversation, especially as our mental health counselors deal with people, is to, you know, placing the conversation in a non-COVID way, but very much around psychosocial support. So can we give you food support? Can we help you with employment? Can we help whatever it is that outside of the health conversation. Um, trust building has been instrumental because as I said, there's a fear and hesitancy to deal with healthcare providers. So again, our counselors and our teams are told that it really is just about building more of a, uh, so the social service sort of um, what we have found is that uh, the two additional things one is that people will believe religious leaders far more than anybody else and so whether it's the media whether it's newspapers whatever it is but actually if the local religious leader says something they they're going to believe it so it's really important to get their buy-in um, and interestingly, what we found is that WhatsApp is considered a reliable source of information. So when we would call people on the helpline and after we're done speaking to them, if we send them information on WhatsApp, they would actually pay a lot of attention to it. And uh, this became, this was particularly instrument in, a ca in cases where a lot of people were really worried about the fact that before going back to work, the employers would ask them to get a negative test result but hospitals weren't going to do a negative test results if you didn't have symptoms and the test itself is very expensive. So, you know, we had sent them over WhatsApp, the government notification saying that a secondary test is not important and that really helped sort of build the trust, but also uh, they just believed it was a credible source of information. So anything we sent to them over WhatsApp, um, you know, was, was really found to be reliable. Interesting. Eric, do you have a perspective on this you'd like to share? Yeah, so first of all, I agree. You know, the, the first and foremost, the cultural context, as well as I think the clear success that happens in community health worker programs. I think, you know, that I've written on that. and I, I just really, there's nothing, you know, by definition, that is fixing a last mile problem when you can send people into the community. I think the thing that we have going on, you know, and again, probably more with a Western focus, where a lot of the information is internet derived. I think, you know, the couple things. One, diagnostically looking at what messages are doing the most harm and why are they doing the most harm. So again, looking for, for dis and malinformation campaigns like don't wear masks or if you wear a mask, you're giving up your constitutional rights or things like that, right? So I think, I think one, diagnose and, 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 and target counter messaging uh, appropriately to that. 
also uh, feel out the actors. I think we're, we're still in the early days, but I, you know, I do think we're going to see more and more of these platforms from Facebook to WhatsApp really going after what they feel to be true malinformation and taking messages down and stuff like that. So I think on, on to the individual patient or the community level, I don't think anything trumps social psycho, uh, psychological and community culturally based interventions, especially by human beings from those communities. Uh, at, a, at a large internet macro level, I think you do have to look at it like it's all malware. Like it's, you know, it's a virus that's causing pain and destruction on the internet and you need to stop it like it's WannaCry for, for the really large um, campaigns at scale. Often those are traced back to international state actors that are actually just trying to feed the flames of, of discontent. Uh, and so the less politically stable an area is, the more um, vulnerable they are to this, whether it was, you know, the Rohingya Myanmar or whether it's the US political election today. Yeah, I'm hearing. So yeah, I'm hearing repeated themes about contacts being important, uh, and um, certainly the, the community health workers and, and the human contact uh, to, to to combat both the misinformation and to build the the build the trust um, being important. Again, I welcome anybody in in the audience to, to chime in with their experience. Sandeep, did you I, I have a perspective on this? Yeah, I think we did both. We were able to do the community health volunteer worker-based workshops and that had a huge impact, I think, like everyone said. so. But the other thing that we also uh, tried and there was a good response was actually conducting online webinars, even with the low-income community. So I think what happened uh, because of COVID was there was an opening up uh, in terms of people becoming more comfortable with the use of technology through smartphones for even like using Google Meets or uh, any one of those platforms. And we particularly worked with schools uh, to work with the parents and that allowed us to work with a large group. So I think with the in-person, the, the scale was limited. There was a little bit more depth, but with the online, we were able to cover a much larger number uh, and a reasonable amount of depth, I think, because there were questions. The idea was that it remained interactive. So we were able to still work with uh, 200 odd at a group uh, and keep it still a little interactive to get questions in, uh, very practical questions like how how do we wash the vegetables when, the, when we get it from outside, right? So how do we, what do we do if we go outside? How do we clean our clothes? Or when we come back in, what are the precautions to take? Because some people work from essential services as well. So I think using the online platforms for holding these, uh, meetings even with at least in, in the context of Mumbai that was still uh, effective at least in the urban poor in India it did work. So I've seen yeah webinars, uh, WhatsApp, community health workers as sort of the, the vehicles for, for conveying these messages. Has, has anybody had any particular success or recommendations for folks in the audience about um, sources of reliable information or resources or tools that, that you've ha found uh, useful um, either for yourself and your, and your staff to, to form the, you know, the, the cultural, the, I guess the, the locally uh, message or, or for your, your patients as far as directing them to a particular resource. I had put something on the chat group uh, it's a kids uh, USA uh, kids social behavioral change communication for emergency preparedness I kids. Uh, I found it very useful uh, in our rolling out of social behavioral change communication with community health frontiers. Where where can people find that? I put it on the chats. Okay, I'm seeing. Uh, and and which which organization uh, produces that? It's, it's, it's a USA uh, document, USA. so if you Google the name, you will get it. <laughs> gotcha. Thank you for that. I, I, tools or recommendations? I, sorry. Well, I, yeah, I mean, what I found, maybe not a specific recommendation, but an example, is that there's a lot of specificity to this. For example, I um, advise a group that's like a super working group that about 30,000 
uh, breast cancer patients in the US, uh, Facebook communities, NGOs, things like that. And, you know, one of the things that went on there really on was, well, I'm stage four cancer, so I'll be deprioritized for a ventilator because I'm dying anyway. You know, and so it was, it was very, you know, what, what helps there is getting really specific counter messaging directly from the American Cancer Society, from large cancer centers and stuff like that, that could go directly to those groups to deal with the specific concern they had. So sometimes you've got to do really large messaging and sometimes you've got to do very focused small messaging. Um, similarly, we had people come in and, you know, talk about how to use a home pulse oximeter and how to do, how to do different things like that. Um, because of course, these, these patients that are hugely immunocompromised justifiably were scared to go to clinical centers <laughs> to get care because they knew they were, they were risking being exposed to something that might, might push them over. So, so yeah, I mean, there, there are some, some good things out there, but also, you know, it cannot be community specific enough in, in my, in my experience. Great. Thanks. Um, so, I mean, we've talked a little bit about erosion of trust uh, um, in, in the medical system. Um, let's shift gears a little bit and maybe sort of look to the, to the future and sort of what, what the ramifications are of sort of what's, what's going on. Um, we talked a little bit about, at the beginning about vaccine uh, coming out and, and polling suggesting 50% of people wouldn't Take that about vaccination. You see, this a problem in, in, in your area of, of practice, the, the, the idea of the, this blatant mistrust. And, and is there anything that we can do about that, this uh, sort of right now? Um, and are there any other sort of misinformation challenges other than the vaccine that's sort of keeping you up at night as far as delivering care? Tough question, sorry. <laughs> Maybe I'll go, I'll go first because of the vaccine thing. Um, you know, I, I do think of it a couple of ways. I, I think that stigma and misinformation and fears are just real and need to be addressed at hand. I think the example of, of funerals is an excellent example. I'm going to use that if that's okay in the future because it's, 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 it's just really paints the right picture. But I do think that also we have to think about the sponsored campaigns. You know, the fact that when you've got you know, possibly hundreds of thousands of dollars going into anti-vax campaigns that are organized. I think we have to determine whether or not that is crime for some of these things, right? So I think that's why it's really tough and fascinating to think about misinformation versus disinformation versus malinformation. You know, in the U.S., you can't go into a crowded theater and yell fire. There are consequences for doing that. You put people at harm. Yet we have seen people go in with phone calls and paper pamphlets into marginalized Somali communities in Minnesota and, and you know, convince people not to vaccinate their children, right? So, so you know, that this, this, this really malfeasant piece is kind of where I focus. And I think it's something that's hard, but also separable from what I think of it as truly culturally based and in some ways innocent based misinformation, people just being people the way they've always been and not knowing how to interpret new messages. I think we need very specific mitigations for the different types of possible harms, but also the different vectors of that these things are going on from. Anita, did you have something to share? Yeah, I was just gonna say, you know, what Eric said is so relevant and very, very relevant to Pakistan because we don't have any such, um, you know, uh, concepts in place. If in a theater in Pakistan, if you went and yelled fire, nothing is going to happen to you, you know. And so, um, so there's really no control or no monitoring of that at all. Um, in terms of the vaccine, absolutely, uh, it is very concerning because Pakistan is ranked number three in the world with the with the least vaccinated children. I think just 60 percent of children are vaccinated in in Pakistan, and you know. Uh, polio is still uh, quite present in Pakistan as well. So that gives you a sense of how, uh, how anti-vaccination people are and how difficult it is to convince them. Part of it is also politically driven relating to the conspiracy theories, especially the polio campaign and whatever happened with Osama bin Laden. That is very, very, um, you know, it's very, very um, real for people um, and still very much in their minds. It's not a distant memory. So uh, that has all fed into these large conspiracy theories around vaccines. And because of that, people hesitate definitely in, in a place where, you know, people, I, as I said, just 
a large part of the population doesn't even believe COVID is real. And then to convince them to get a vaccine, I'm sure is going to be a Herculean task. Um, but, but in this regard, I think the idea, as I said, is just fundamentally trust building. And I think that unfortunately is going to take a lot of time um, for, for people to come around. I can add on a little bit and fully agree. Um, Kenya is among the 92 countries which is eligible for the vaccine, uh, but there are also already stories of are we going to be the guinea pigs again. Uh, but I think what is really important to do the community entry well and involve leaders and involve the Minister of Health. Um, sometimes I think we are too impatient to get things done, but if you get support of all those different uh, leaders, I think, um, and have a united voice, I probably think you'll be able to break through. And again, there you can still use again the community health volunteers with door-to-door -door messaging and social behavioral change communication. Okay. And I guess let, let's let's just I mean wrap this up uh, with, with sorry. I, I, have, I think besides vaccines, my uh, I think one part is around vaccines. Once we have them, there will be a big question on how it gets distributed, uh, particularly in India. I think given the population that we have and the and the level of, I think, spread of the population, uh, where will it go first? And there will be a lot of, uh, I, I think, discussion and uh, around that. But I think one aspect is around go looking forward is to think of vaccine and say what's the, what we can do about it. But I think an equal number of I feel emphasis should be on spreading information around how we can strengthen our immunity. So one, I think there is a lot of dialogue on what to do to prevent the spread, but I do see a missing space for something which says, what do we do to actually fundamentally enhance our own immunity? So uh, that builds our strength to fight uh, the infection if it comes. So build sort of natural immunity uh, around the virus. and. I think the fact that 90% people or 80% people at least are asymptomatic and are recovering without getting affected, to me, it does indicate that there is something that, uh, that, that enables that immunity. And, and we are seeing that the numbers are different across different uh, geographies. So what's making that work? So I think trying to also spend uh, maybe some time, there is already some understanding of it, at least in the Indian context, there is... Uh, around what can help build immunity. But I think if we also spend uh, information and resources on spreading that message, that might be uh, a lot more cost effective uh, as a strategy as well to uh, prevent this. And I think the core belief is we do, I think our body has that ability, has that wisdom uh, to, to counter this virus. And that's what at least 90% of people infected are seeming to suggest. Thank you all for, for sharing your, your perspectives. I just want to give you a, each an opportunity to, to provide some closing remarks, perhaps some um, sharing some thoughts on how folks should be planning their, their messaging and, and communication strategies going forward based on what we've uh, heard today. And I'd love to you know, hear any questions uh, from the audience as well for our panelists or, or for the audience. So, uh, Eric, do you want to start off with any closing thoughts? Yeah, I guess, I guess just two real quick. One, I think just to restate something I think we've all said and that specificity matters almost more than anything when a cultural context, um, messaging, what, what's the, what, you know. And, and then the only other thing is, is to um, think about how to organize if it's overpowering. You know, you know, one of the things that has happened in the US like anti-vax or something like that is that, uh, you know, doctors and scientists are being attacked by essentially troll armies when they put up a pro-vaccine message or something like that. So I, I, I think that, you know, there's one of the famous parts of, of cybersecurity is, is the asymmetry, how a, a lone hacker could take down a very large corporation with a hack. And I think there's a lot of asymmetry, asymmetry in this messaging, whether it's the opinion of one influential leader or whether it's organized. So I think be specific and think about the reasons for the, the misinformation and try to deal with those actual reasons, but also think about the vehicles and get help if you need it. Great. 
Great, thank you. Anita? Um, yeah, I think in addition to everything that's said, the thing that I would add uh, is that um, it's really important for the narrative and the information to be culturally, culturally appropriate uh, and contextual. Uh, and as I said, whether that means um, uh, talk, giving messages that people can actually practically implement or whether that means utilizing religious leaders and you know, framing the conversation in, in, in a very spiritual based narrative, um, whatever that is, I do really feel like it needs to be culturally appropriate. Hi, any, any closing thoughts? Uh, yeah, sure. I think uh, my main uh, thing would be to harmonize messages and have a united voice, but also use, for example, in Kenya, we, everybody has a mobile phone, so we can use mobile phone also for wider reach and also ensure that we translate some of these messages in local languages since not everybody speaks English or Swahili. Sandeep, any, any closing thoughts? No, I think I jumped the gun, so my would be just focus on immunity building. I think that's, that's the sure shot we have to success in this. Outstanding. Well, well thank you all uh, for, for uh, joining us uh, this morning or this afternoon. I'm going to look to the chat to see if there's a question here. Um, Please feel free to, add, to chime in, either uh, unmute your mic and, and ask a, a question or put something in uh, the chat. We've got a long question here. Oh yeah, um, Donna's put some information on, on effectiveness of vaccines, but I'm not sure there's a... Uh, Question there. Any yeah, other questions? Yeah, I can there? articulate it. Yeah. It's, 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 it's an opinion, actually, not a question. Um, it's just that we're, we're faced with some skepticism that's not rooted in the traditional anti-vax campaign and movement uh, at, by activists. And uh, even knowledgeable people may look at influenza vaccine as a reasonable proxy for COVID vaccine, uh, in that it's a seasonal virus, it's respiratory, uh, everybody's urged to get it. We're getting messaging already from CDC and WHO that this is really important. And yet the effectiveness of the vaccine is, is certainly under 50%. And for elderly people, it's almost certainly around 25%, and in some years, even less. So balancing this, hey, it may not really protect you. It's not the greatest vaccine in the world with uh, what well, we have a public health benefit here is a nuanced argument. And I mentioned in the chat some other issues as well around uh, the speed of development of uh, the uh, somewhat vain and, and self-promoting nature of some of the drug companies that are developing the vaccines, instant millionaires for some of them. Uh, it, it's not really surprising that the folks who, at least in the U.S. and probably in every country, are concerned about the COVID vaccine. Um, there, there are just a, a lot of reasons why it's not just the core anti-vaxxer group, but it's much broader. I, if I could, I actually agree with all that. I, I think that's where early in my comments, I said, make sure the misinformation isn't true <laughs> in your messaging, right? And that, that, that they, these things aren't panaceas um, and they shouldn't be treated like them. So I, I agree with all of that. That was well said. I think we're, we're, we're right at the, the top of the hour. So I um, want to thank again our panel uh, for joining us today. I think we had a, a great conversation with some practical advice for, uh, for our folks out there on how thinking about strategies uh, for messaging um, to, to deliver healthcare. So certainly you know, keeping it uh, uh, specific to, to the context and, and building, using um, psychosocial uh, tools to, to build trust with your with your patients and leveraging the, the channels and the local leadership, all, all, uh, all great uh, advice. So thank you again. Um, just real real quick, uh, we we'd love to get your input on on our next panel, which which is scheduled uh, for September. So please um, send us your, your suggestions on topics that you are concerning you or affecting you in your uh, healthcare operations. Um, and uh, 
again, that, that we'll be keeping this discussion going on, uh, on the groups.io. So uh, thank you again, and hope everybody uh, stay safe and, and uh, has a, a pleasant day. Thank you. Meeting you all. Take care. Thank you. Will just discovered yesterday that you can do a dream school and do a lot more class. And so there's a bunch of class in the lab. I can clap a lot more than you people. It's so hard to try to do that. That's one. If you need to make more progress, Thank you.